Good morning, folks. We'll hit cool science today on the Earth, the Moon, Mars, the solar system, and space explosions. We'll start with our star over at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last 24 hours takes the northern coronal hole towards the departing limb. Its solar wind will impact Earth within another 24 hours, but it's not like we don't have that already. Elevated stream intensity in the solar wind has leveled off at fairly high speed, geomagnetic storminess continued overnight at low levels, and reverberations are expected today. All of this energy is integrating into the atmosphere and the ground, and over the last two days we've seen a tremendous increase in the reported electrical fires, and AT&T had a major system outage for a number of hours, relatively expected with a three-day geomagnetic event. Going right to the science articles next, and we're starting with the moon. Turns out they may need to do the lunar version of an Earth-sheltered home, a moon-sheltered home. Radiation is tremendously high on the lunar surface and will present mortal challenges for anyone too exposed. Up next, more water on Mars. The surface layers have considerable ices. They knew that underground lakes existed on the red planet, and now they are finding even more. Its salinity keeps it liquid, and folks, we find life within Earth's underground lakes. There's not currently any rationale to deny the possibility of subterranean life on Mars this moment. Let's go out in the solar system. This is Pluto's orbit in gray, and it's pretty close in distance from the Sun to another trans-Neptunian object, WC510. This object has a slightly more inclined orbit than Pluto, but it also just pulled off a rare space event. Turns out it's a binary planetoid system, and it eclipsed a binary star system in deep space. Without the impossibly rare event of a local binary dropping the light curve on a distant one, we'd probably never know that this thing wasn't alone out there. Folks, the nanograv detection and resulting papers are becoming a flood in the journals and in the preprint archives, and I haven't hit on them too much in the morning show because nobody really has any idea what they're looking at. They initially thought it might be an inflation-driven signature of gravitational waves in the universe, but no, that's not going to work, as you can read here. One of the most popular new things in space science is being fumbled around in the papers daily, We'll come back to it at some point if they get their heads together. But at least they've detected something. Here, we've got a forecast that bad theory and imperfect data are going to confuse them into thinking they've found dark interactions when reality will say that they haven't. At a certain point of study, it becomes apparent what is just around the bend. A crystal ball looking at a mistake here. Folks, I saw something yesterday that almost gave me a coronary. We know that CMIP6 is the new climate model standard, especially since the solar particle forcing dataset was released for the first time. After about 18 months, it was becoming sad to see CMIP5 usage in models, and availing oneself of the best data in models seems just academically rudimentary, apparently not for climate scientists. But then I go to climate.gov and see which models they are using for their projections to scare the bejesus out of people, and, uh, what? CMIP3, like three iterations ago of the model, from 2007? Well, back then, they had no clue about the oversensitivity of CO2 in their models, the bias and error propagation, and the uncertainties that existed with those and the clouds. CMIP3 is a complete joke, like mainstream climate science. If you missed our video called Climate Science Collapses, it's merely the latest casualty in the sniffles heard around the world this year. Link is below. Watch it if you haven't seen it yet. Up next, a lesson in tiny nova. We look first to a new x-ray burst from a pulsar. These are energetically astounding in x-rays, but have super tiny spherical ejecta. The pulsars do have a micro version of a nova that is so small that if it happened on the sun, it wouldn't even reach Mercury. It wouldn't matter because the x-rays would destroy the entire solar system, but hey, we're talking about ejecta. Dwarf nova are both smaller and less luminous than the expected cyclical solar micronova, and it turns out they can be very tricky. What was thought to be a classical nova is likely a dwarf, indicating the progress still needed in the field, especially as we look back at older, inferior data. Apparently, the dwarf nova looked like a larger classical nova in decades past, and yet we've seen dwarf nova also have no ejected material at all. It's a widespread just an evaporative fizzle on that one. I hope that the concept of a nova event on the sun, not destroying the entire solar system and being able to happen over and over with life continuing on this planet is not out of the realm of your possibility. These days, half the recurrent nova they see would not kill everything on the earth if they happened on the sun. 
we may just have a strange look to our local heavens in the aftermath. We greatly appreciate your support. I'll admit I'm having a great time writing this new book on the Micronova and the Cyclical Earth Disaster. Thank you everyone for your suggestions a few days ago. I'm in sixth gear and we've got wind maps and shots of our star to close and of course we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now it's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe everyone.